with audio. Join with audio. Coolsies, all right, we've got people joining. Tartle is the first person joining the party. Um, if I can just ask everyone to mute their microphones, that would be sweet. Okay, cool. All right, guys, so we're just gonna wait another minute for people to join um, because it's, people are logging in as we speak. But yeah, welcome to the party. Glad you could join me this evening. It's um, weird weather, it's like rainy, but it's hot. I don't understand it. Um, so the humidity is quite high and it's very muggy, even though it shouldn't be. Uh, okay, so tonight we're doing part of a three-part series about pangolins, bats, and insectivores, the true shrews, the true moles. So tonight we're just doing the pangolins because everyone's been asking about pangolins and it's been on the media a lot lately. So yeah, we're going to cover them. We're going to answer a bunch of questions and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for some Q&A. So away we go. Cool, so pangolins. Of course, every week we talk about book of the week. This is a cool little pocket book that you can get from usually from most airports and you know uh, exclusive books, bargain books. It's called Skull Duggery. It's a small little ID guide for skulls. Some of it's quite rudimentary, but in the case of some of the odd animals, like you'll find skulls in there, you might actually not know what you're looking at. Um, it's things that you're not quite sure what you're trying to ID. The difference between a a um, Stambok and a Hreisbok, for example, and they're okay, there we go. That's what I'm looking at. So, but most of the big skulls in there, obviously we all recognize what a buffalo is, but it's quite a nice little book to have. Um, and just so you can browse through it and pick up some things you didn't know. All right, so pangolins. Pangolins are found throughout tropical, subtropical and semi-arid areas across the old world. If we remember what the old world is, they are areas of Africa, Asia, excluding Australia and Europe. Okay, they're secretive, almost exclusively number, uh, nocturnal, and they have very low population density. They cover large tracts of land. They're very infrequent breeders, and um, yeah, they have very low populations. So when you kill one, you really just take a massive chunk out of the population. And um, the recent 20th and 21st century human population explosions, because it went from a billion to 7 billion in the space of 100 years, uh, has put increasing pressure on pangolin populations. Pangolins have no real threats in nature, apart from the occasional very adamant lion or very adamant tiger um, or very adamant bear. But um, typically they don't get preyed on, they're, they're, they're difficult to take out. Um, and only humans have been a real threat for them. They've remained relatively unchanged for over 50 million years and nothing's really bugged them except for us because we get in our heads that they're magic and people love magic. so. And they've got all these magical muti cures, magical mystical cures. Muti, by the way, for those people that don't know, it's an African word for traditional medicine. Okay, so we're going to look at pangolins to begin with. But for a long time, people thought that pangolins, armadillos, ant bears, art fox were all closely related. And we've actually recently realized in the last 40, 50 years, physically and genetically, they're not related. There's a lot of evolutionary convergence, but actually, in particular, armadillos and, and pangolins, which everyone thinks are related, they're not in any way related. Uh, armadillos are xenotherians, they're from South America, and pangolins are on a whole other story, which we're going to discuss today. So you can look at the skull of a pangolin, it's got absolutely no teeth, maybe some rudimentary bottom and sizes, but almost none. It's got a very small cranium, a very small skull, and very small brain and quite primitive underdeveloped eyes. And again, they've got not much going around their head in terms of the structure. Um, zygomatic processes on the side are underdeveloped. The, the, the lower jaw is very weak, almost just vestigial really. And quite a large rostrum nose breathing area. Obviously they rely significantly on their sense of smell not too much on their, on their eyesight. If you look at an ant bear, which everyone seems to think they're related because of the diet, um, it's quite different, actually. It's quite a pronounced, quite a developed jaw, very elongated face. And remember, ant bears are xenotherians. They come from South America. We've briefly glanced over them. We might go further back into xenotherians on another date, but not today. And the last, of course, is armadillos, which everyone seems, again, to think that they're related to pangolins. And I guess you could see why people would think that, but armadillos, ant bears, and sloths are xenotherians. So they are very closely related. And it's simply a case of convergent evolution. They're all, of course, uh, they're all insectivores, much like an art fark, but again, no relationship. 
So pangolins are actually very closely related to the carnivores. Those are the cats, the dogs, the bears, the seals, those guys. And you'd say, what, really? They're actually related to carnivores? But they've shown conclusively that they are actually distant cousins of modern carnivores. They separated about 78 million years ago. So that's about 13 million years before the dinosaurs went extinct. And they were very primitive and rudimentary, but they've been around for a hell of a long time. So they are what we call living fossils. And um, while their scales look reptilian, people say, oh, they cross between a reptile and a, a reptile and a, um, a mammal. They're not. They're, they're fully placental, so they're actually quite developed mammals. If you remember way back when we talked about the different types of mammals, placental mammals existed at the time of dinosaurs. They were just very small. Um, and the actual scales are very different to reptilian scales. They just have, again, an evolutionary convergence where two unrelated organisms develop the same sort of processes. On top of being very scaly and be able to roll into a ball, pangolins actually also spray a foul anal fluid, which is able to, they use to deter predators. And um, yeah, you don't want to get on that on you. It's things like a skunk. It almost, people don't really have any records of it, or not a lot of records, because it, you don't come across pangolins very often. So you don't get an opportunity to get sprayed very often. But on the rare occasion that people have picked them up, there have been incidences of them spraying people. So yum. And they, again, like a lot of the other animals that they were thought were related to, feed exclusively on termites and ants. Okay, myrmecophagy, if you remember that word from the art fox last time. So here we can see the map, the historical map of pangolins. There's quite a few species of pangolins, which we'll discuss today. And they're separated between Ferro and Phyllodota and Carnivora, separated about 78 million years ago. Uh, by 50 million years ago, all the carnivore families started forming. Pangolins, true families, modern families started forming around 37 million years ago. But pangolin fossils have been found back as far back as 50 million years ago. So they say, how do we know that they separated 78 million years ago if we don't actually have the fossils? The fossils are very handy and they help us. But genetics is actually a lot more powerful than fossils because genetics don't lie. It's like your fingerprints. They don't lie. Um, and so how do we work out the evolutionary relationship and how do we work out the dates that they separate? And there's a pretty cool thing called a molecular clock. I may have brushed over this in other lessons. Uh, I don't recall doing it. I haven't looked back through all my lessons to check, um, but we'll go over it again if we have. So molecular clocks are based on DNA and the mutations in your DNA. Your D DNA mutates with every generation. So when you have a child, there's a slight mutation. And when they have a child, there's a slight mutation. And they can work at the rate of mutation per generation. There are four nucleotides in DNA, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Adenine and thymine always pair together, and cytosine and guanine always pair together. So ATCG, so you can have TA or AT, and C, uh, CG or GC. And those are, that's the alphabet of, the, of DNA. And using those four letters, they literally can write the entire book of life. Every organism is programmed from those four letters based on the combinations. And based on the mutations and the flaws in the DNA, they can actually work out on average how many separate, uh, how long it took for these two species to separate. And people say that's how, it's quite, um, you know, it's speculative. But then when you actually look at the fossil evidence, which is based on other types of testing, more often than not, in fact, almost always, the fossil evidence and the genetic evidence just lines up perfectly. Like, again, I use the example with humans and chimpanzees. Using a molecular clock, we've shown that humans and chimpanzees separated around 6 million years ago from common ancestry. And lo and behold, the fossil evidence also points to 6 million years. So ties in perfectly. Um, so there's, it's, there's really no room for argument because there, there's no counter evidence beyond you just don't want to believe it. Um, and the same thing can be said for the phyllodotans and the, the, the carnivora. They, in terms of the molecular clock, it dates back to 78 million years ago. And all the fossil evidence points in that direction. Then we may find something in future that, can, uh, that contradicts that. But right now with the current cutting edge genetic studies, nothing contradicts it. So that's called a molecular clock. And that's how we can date organisms, not only with fossils, but also with DNA. So they can work out how closely related you are to a mouse. I'm not gonna get into the details, based on your comparative molecular clocks, working out the average rate of mutations per, per generation. So they can take two related species and compare the number of different mutations between them. And scientists can work at how many generations on average. It's not like exactly in 1,968 generations because there's always a variance 
I might have a kid when I'm 25, you might have a kid when you're 35. So there is a room for error with, with generations, but they say on average. So it's not an exact date, but there's on average, it would have taken this amount of time, maybe give or take a million years. And that's why they say 56 to 54 million years ago, because there is that era of judgment, but it's not 56 to 26. It's not that big a discrepancy. It's one or two million years. And in the greater scheme of things, a million years is really nothing. I mean, to us it is, but in terms of Earth history, it's nothing. So you can see, again, with a common ancestor having a code, and then 25 million years later, they have different mutations in the code. And then again, 15, 15 million years later, they have other mutations in the code. And the greater the number of mutations, then they can start working out how great, how further the separated they are and how far back they would have to be have a common ancestor. The long story, I've simplified it. It's a lot more complicated than that. You need 25 years of university studies to go and even begin to comprehend the depths of it. But this is a beginner's beginner's explanation of it. So if you want to understand it, go study at a university. I, I just read the clip notes and I say, okay, that makes sense. Moving on. Okay, so pangolins, because they have few or rudimentary to no teeth, depending on species, they cons consume small stones, little pebbles to aid digestion. And here's what's really interesting. Because they have no teeth, they've evolved gizzards like birds, and they have small grinding plates in their stomachs, which coupled with the small stones actually aid digestion. And much like art fox anteaters, pangolins consume vast quantities of termites and ants, and thus regulating their populations. And actually are very important for ecology because termites can get out of control and ants can get out of control. And these guys are there to mop up the mess. So the earliest known fossil that we have from a pangolin is Eomanus. Okay, and again, in terms of physiological structure, between 48 to 40 million years ago, they found numerous fossils of these guys ranging from that period of time. They found fossils after that, but this is the first, um, first conclusive one based on like comprehensive studies. And uh, fully fed pangolins in all respects dating back 48 million years ago. So pangolins really are like a living fossil. They, they, there's been no real ecological pressure on them to change because predators haven't been hunting them. They just eat ants and termites and ants and termites have been around for millions and millions of years and they just get by. So only humans have come along in the last couple of million years and um, particularly the last 700,000 years and have just been causing chaos for them. So yay us. So modern pangolins are in the Manidae family. There's a word for you. Probably a lot of people don't know their family name. The Manidae family. And they're broken into two, sam two families, the Asiatic pamlin, uh, pangolins and the African pangolins. And never the twain shall meet. So everyone thinks it's just one pangolin. There's actually quite a few species. So the Asian, pa Asian pangolins are divided into four species in one genus, the Manus genus. So there's the Indian pangolin. He's got quite big. He's about 1.2 meters long. He weighs quite a bit, up to 20 kilograms. The Chinese pang pangolin is tiny, only about 30 to 60 centimeters, depending on males and females. Really small. Very cute little guy at the bottom of there. The Philippines pangolin is quite large. I think they get at most 80 centimeters, but on average, in 60 centimeters. And the pseudopangolin or the Javan pangolin is the size of your hand. And the pseudopangolin is actually one of David Attenborough's favorite animals. And he's purposely said if there was eight species, you could, one of the eight species you could save from extinction, the pseudopangolin would be one of them. He is besotted with them. And he talked about, I read in one of his books, um, I've got his autobiography. And um, what was it? Biography or autobiography? I can't remember. Anyway, it talked about um, when he was early, starting early in his career, he, he, he rescued a, a small pseudo pangolin from being used for bushmeat by the locals in Java. And uh, he's fell in love with them and he's loved them his entire life. So the pseudo pangolin is freaking adorable. African pangolins, by contrast, are actually broken into two groups. You get the ground pangolins and the tree pangolins. Uh, South Africa only has one species of pangolin. If you go to Mozambique, they've got two species. So there are two species of, of pangolin. The giant pangolin, which is the largest, they weigh a whopping 33 kilograms and get up to 1.5 meters long. Okay, really big boys. They're only found in Central and West Africa uh, in the tropical areas. They thrive in those thick jungles. Uh, and rainforests. The ground pangolin has the greatest distribution across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Pretty much wherever there's ants, there's these guys, or except for where they've been annihilated by people. Um, there's also two species of 
tree pangolin, the long-tailed pangolin, otherwise known as the black-bellied pangolin, and the tree pangolin, otherwise known as the white-bellied pangolin. Uh, those are the other names. But um, both these guys are highly adept at um, climbing, and they actually have evolved prehensile tails, much like New World monkeys when we discuss monkeys. Um, and they're able to actually use their trees to grip and to climb on trees. And it's amazing, fully prehensile tails, very elongated. Sometimes the tail can be two thirds of the body length. If you look back at the first picture I had on the introduction page, you could see uh, maybe at the end of the class, I'll show you the length of the tail there. So what's often found with the ground pangolins, less so the tree pangolins, is that they walk on two legs. And the reason for this is this actually to counterbalance the weight of the tail. The tail makes up often half the body's weight, and it basically acts as a shield to protect the body. And they use their, their front limbs almost exclusively for digging. And a pangolin, ground pangolin, can dig a, um, a hole in the ground up to 3.5 meters deep uh, underground. So they really get burrowed into the ground. It's very difficult to excavate them. And that's another reason why they're just so hard to kill if you're a predator, except for humans. So they're highly adept. They walk like little tyrannosauruses, which is quite adorable. And um, yeah, basically walking on two legs is a nice counterbalance for them for walking. Um, for them um, having these elong uh, elongated tails. And again, you can see over here, they use their scales to protect their body and their tail wraps around the entire body shield and they tuck their head in between their legs, making them basically impenetrable. I've watched, I personally haven't seen, but I've watched many documentaries with lions trying to chew on a pangolin and eventually just gives up. It gets a mouth full of spikes and just says, you know what, I'm done. This is not worth it. It's like trying to eat a pine cone. Now, what's amazing is the scales have evolved numerous times in nature, not just in animals, but in plants. You look at the pine cone, overlapping scales is one of the best forms of defense to protect against fires, protect against cold, and protects against insect predation. Okay, and only when the, when, the, when the pine cone seeds are ready does it open up and actually disperse. It's a wonderful combination between flexibility and between um, um, protection. But there's a compromise of both because you don't have a complete shield and you don't have complete flexibility. So there's a bit of a compromise. The same thing with proteas, having that compromise between flexible scales, which actually protect and shield the inside of the body, but allowing it to open later. So again, that compromise, a bit of both worlds, but the master of none. Also historically, it first evolved in fish. And the fish actually have relatively little mobility in terms of their body movement. They only move left and right, uh, but there's not much in terms of their flexibility. So their scales tend to be quite compact against the body. It does allow for flexibility, but quite limited flexibility. And the most flexible fish have the least developed scales. Um, and because it simply scales do not afford that um, flexibility because it does restrict some movement. Of course, it evolved again in reptiles, independently of fish, because fish, uh, Tiktaalik, the ancestors of all vertebrates, uh, he was a scaleless fish, or very, very uh, primitively scale fish, and amphibians evolved from him, and scales evolved independently from amphibian-like ancestors. The Captahanids, if you remember back four months ago, five months ago, we talked about Captahanids. So scales have evolved independently on reptiles, and Although birds have evolved independently, uh, sorry, ver birds evolved from reptiles with scales, they've modified those scales to maintain the same sort of protection, but allow them flight and warmth. So the actual, one of the, uh, one of the, the evolutionary trajectories, one of the evolutionary pushes of developing uh, feathers was the motility of birds' ancestors, the therapsids. So again, you can look at, we're going to talk about therapsids in a second. So pangolin scales, again, have this flexibility and but this durability. So it's a compromise between both. Um, and again, what you'll find again with the armadillo scales, to a lesser extent, these scales overlapping the bodies. So why are scales less common in mammals? So why is only the pangolin and to a lesser extent the armadillo have scales, but all reptiles have scales, all fish with some exceptions have scales, and birds have scales that are modified to feathers. Why was it so common in these guys? Simply, if you remember, talked about therapsids, the answer, those uh, reptilian ancestors of mammals we talked about in the early classes, they evolved differently to other reptiles. Reptiles are more squat and in generally, and in generally less 
in need of flexibility. They rely more of burst speeds. They don't need to be flexible. They don't need to uh, run down their prey. Um, and their whole lifestyle doesn't really require them to be that flexible. If you look at a gecko, he's quite squat. If you look at a crocodile, he's quite squat. Most of your reptiles are quite squat and they have very relatively limited flexibility compared to a cat or a dog. You try to take an iguana, you take a cat and it's chalk and cheese. They are in no way comparable in their flexibility. There are exceptions, snakes, but snakes are highly specialized, and that's a whole other story. We'll get onto them another day when we get to reptiles. So the ancestors of mammals, therapsids, evolved to be more elongated and have a more upright standing structure. So greater flexibility was encouraged. So scales did not benefit them. They actually had those bony scutes, which we talked about with therapsids, and that allowed for greater flexibility, but it also didn't allow for the coverage. So... Um, Pangolins, because of the ecological pressures, of re-evolved scales um, much, much, much later. So they're not a vestigial reptilian species, as some people speculate. They're, they came from an ancestor that didn't have scales, and through ecological pressures, they evolved scales, much like reptiles evolved scales, even though their amphibian ancestors didn't have scales. Therapsid dinosaurs also stood upright and became more elongated, um, like your Velociraptors, Tyrannosaurus rexes, and those guys. And because of them, they also started to lose that covering and that protection of scales because they needed to be more flexible. Birds, rat, bir birds of prey, or all birds for that matter, um, Velociraptors, Dinachiosaurus, Allosaurus, Spinosaurus, they all were very flexible, very motile pre predators. And they needed to be more flexible. So feathers in part evolved as a way of giving insulation, but also allowing more flexibility. They were fluffy rather than hardy. Um, and that's just a bit of a sidetrack and a bit of a segue into why into one of the possible ecological pressures that encouraged feathers to form on birds long before flight ever did. If you remember that talk we did about birds six months ago. So therapsids were these reptilian ancestors, kind of like a blur between a reptile and a mammal. And they had that upright stand. And of course, with that upright stand, they would run and they would be more mobile and walk long distance. And that required flexibility and scales don't benefit mammals in that respect. Reptiles don't have that problem. So scales have stuck around in reptiles. Of course, theropod dinosaurs, um, not therapsid, theropods, which are two-legged dinosaurs, later birds. Again, they started evolving feathers because that would be allowed for greater flexibility, but with insulation and warmth and all the other benefits that came. So that's why mammals don't often have scales because it doesn't actually benefit their lifestyle. You don't want to be a predator with scales. Uh, especially a predator that's to run down prey or chase prey, like a velociraptor or a lion. Having scales would suck. They would make your life difficult because you would hinder your mobility. You need to be fluffy, flexible, bendable, twistable. Pangolin doesn't need that. He eats ants. He's like, I crawl into a ball, I live in a hole, and I eat ants. What do I need to be flexible? What do I need to be mobile for? He's a little tank. Scale mail armor has been emulated throughout history as well. They've recognized the benefit of scale mail with the compromise between mobility and armor. Um, of course, with military technology, we figured out far more efficient technology because um, we, have, um, we have systems that can actually design things faster in evolution. Um, things that we can make in terms of, of machinery can actually make better things than what evolution can produce. So we've got moved past scale mail armor, but the Romans used to use it, the Vikings used to use it, uh, various, various Persian empires used it, the Indians used it, but they figured out better systems. So the moment that something better came around, they dropped it. But nevertheless, scale mail was actually still very popular amongst the Nordic people because it was easy to produce and it was almost as good as full plate mail. Here what we have over here is actually a suit of scale mail made out of pangolin scales and gilded, aka coated in gold. And only the very richest of the Indian kings and the aristocracy could actually have pangolin scale mail. It was basically a big finger to everyone saying, you know what, I am this rich, I can take a critically endangered animal, I can cover it in gold and I can use it as armor. That's just how rich I am. Uh, these critically endangered animals, I have people finding this for me. And it's basically just a, um, it's a, a cost statement as much as an actual fashion statement as it is as much as protection. It would be pretty good protection but uh, nowhere good as, as good as actual steel would be because it's organic material covered in gold and gold is very soft. And I mean, although um, pangolin scales are keratin, keratin is fairly brittle. And I would personally make a choice of having steel scale mail, but this was more of a statement than anything else. They actually gave uh, in 1840, sorry, 1879, 1878, 1879, I remember um, the future King Edward, who was King Edward during 1901 to 1910, 
um, he was actually given by the Indian aristocracy a, scoot, a, a suit of gilded pangolin scale mail, um, which is still in the, uh, one of the British Royal Museums. So plate mail armor, by contrast, is a lot more effective, but a lot less flexible. And only knights on horseback would wear plate mail because you couldn't go running around on a battlefield, you know, in plate mail, you'd be a you know, walking Michelin man. It's just not very flexible. But if you're riding on a horse, you don't have to be that flexible. You're, you're just a, basically a tank on four legs. Infantry, by contrast, actually figured out that chain mail was far more effective than scale mail because scale mail actually had a lot of weak spots. Chain mail had very few weak spots and allowed for flexibility. So inf often infantry in the past would wear, scale, would wear chain mail instead of scale mail if they could afford it. And scale mail was really reserved for people that could just find scraps of meta, band them together and overlap them and there, A for a way you can protect yourself in a battle. So, and that's an example of, of chain mail we have over here. Nothing in nature has ever evolved chain mail. Um, it hasn't been produced ecologically, evolutionary. Maybe in 20, 30 million years, they'll have something that produces it or something equivalent to it. But it's just simply just interlinking chain, which is far, far better than overlapping scales. So that's why you never really see in these historical movies guys wearing scale mail because this was actually with the preferred choice. And usually the Vikings or the very poor raiders that didn't have access to this sort of technology would be the ones using scale mail, but it was less effective. Pangolin poaching is a problem. As pangolins are the most poached mammals on the planet. Not the most poached animal, but the most poached mammal on the planet. Far worse than the rhinos. Far, far, far worse. And uh, between 2004 and 2014, an estimated 1 million pangolins from various species were poached. CITES, which is a convention for the International Trade of, uh, Trade of Endangered Species, lists all eight species are listed as near extinction. They say they're threatened, but CITES states they're all threatened with extinction. Asian pangolin populations, all four species, have decreased by 80% in the last 21 years. So yikes, between 2000 and now 2000 was just the other day. It feels like I was in, it feels like just the other day for me. It's an 80% decrease in that time. It is unlikely that, that, that the Asian pangolins will still be extant, alive, going well by 2050. They'll probably all be extinct in the next 30 years. And there's literally nothing we can do about it except for shutting down the Asian markets that are involved. I'm not blaming any Asian people, I'm saying, but the, the markets are purely in Asia. African, African pangolins are predominantly hit by the bushmeat trade in Africa and to a lesser extent, the Asian market. Um, but our primary threat to African pangolins is the African muti trade and the African bushmeat trade. Asian pangolins are almost exclusively uh, the Chinese market uh, for both mut for the traditional medicines and their, and their um, exotic meats. Anyway, so that is the talk on pangolins. You guys are welcome to ask questions if you want. Uh, sharing is caring. Feel free to ask anything, to say anything, or state anything. Any questions? You guys can take your microphones off. We've got 10 minutes left. Hi, Nick. How are you? Hi, Michelle. Yeah, um, not so much a question, but just a, a little bit of a, a personal um, boast, I suppose. Um, I worked at the um, Johannesburg Wildlife Vet for 18 months, where obviously all the pangolins that get taken out of the trade or that are found by the mm. green scorpions people like that were taken there for rehabilitation to the hospital mm. and done by the african pangolin working group so during my time there i got to help with rehabilitating at, uh, about one a month i suppose so about 18 different pangolins in that yeah. time there and it was such a privilege um, mm. my job was to sort of take them uh, foraging in the evenings when they woke up we would take them to um to eat because of course you can't feed them in rehab you can't mm. put food in a dish and then it, they won't eat out of a dish they have to eat insects they have to eat ants and that proves to be difficult because there's something like 18 different species of ants in south africa mm. and each pangolin only eats the species that's endemic to the area that they come from so when these pangolins arrived on the in the boot of someone's car or were confiscated you know um in the center of hillbra we don't know where they came from so we would take them to the feeding ground and then very often they just wouldn't eat because they would only eat the ants that they're used to. So it becomes like a real problem of, you know, trying to figure out how to feed them and how to keep them alive um, until they could be rehabilitated. So that was the one thing that was very interesting about them. I've never smelt uh, the anal gland or anything, but I, I will say that I think penguins have got the most amazing smell. They just have got this wonderful earthy smell to them. They smell, they smell of rich damp red earth you know and their skin is actually quite 
soft between the scales. When the scales lifted up, the skin is actually like human skin, it's sort of palish and, mm. and soft. Um, and um, yeah, the, the last thing I want to say also is that, uh, I mean, they might have a small brain, but um, they are so charismatic, they are mm. so clever. And ones I was fortunate enough to um, help with raising the babies just behave like baby mammals, like baby cats. They do the same sort of, you know, they're like their tummies tickle, they play peekaboo, they, they are actually very, uh, they interact with you, you know, and they are such, such special creatures. Yeah. And then, yes, to, in connection with the cats, I mean, if they needed to have any medication or treatment, we would use the same dosages as you would for a domestic cat, and we would treat them with the same uh, medication given to cats. So I just wanted to share that little insight. I just love my time there working with them. I didn't actually know about the pang. I didn't know about the ants to be completely honest. That's brand new information for me. So thank you. That's I learned something. Mm. Jeez. <laughs> okay. I had no idea about that. <laughs> That's thank you. I really appreciate that. I love learning stuff. All right. No worries. Cool. <laughs> no worries. Any other questions, guys? Well, things to share, statements, concerns, ideas. We've got like 12 people and everyone's quiet. Yeah. So next week, we're going to start with bats. Um, it's quite a big section. So we're rounding off the Laurasian Therians, okay, which are, again, the Perisodactylans, the Artiodactylans, the Carnivores, the Pangolins, those guys, and then finally the bats, and then I'll see the shrews and the moles. Uh, remember, shrews and moles happen to just have some convergent evolution with elephant shrews and, and uh, golden moles. It's just coincidental but they're nowhere related remember um, those were the afrotherians and we got through the afrotherians which was dugongs manatees elephants hyraxes and the afro insectivores which are elephant shrews art fox and all those guys uh, and then we're just rounding off the the laurasia therians now we'll eventually get through to um, primates and rodents um, and then uh, the rabbits as well and then we're going to start doing some of the weirder things, like maybe you go more in detail with the Xenotherians, which are the the, the weird hip mammals, um, and get into some more detail about those guys. And eventually what I want to get into some reptiles, because we don't do a lot of reptiles, and people don't actually know much about reptile taxonomy. Uh, and it's an interest of mine, it's a passion of mine, and um, well, everything's, I find everything's interesting. But um, we'll do that in future as well, once we work through mammals. We've got a long way to go through mammals, but um, hopefully you guys are going to stick around for the reptiles in future as well. And then also do more on birds. I would like to go back to birds because we just touched on birds when we did that six months ago. Yeah, any other questions, guys? Sharing is curing. Yeah, we've lost one, that's fine. Nope. All right. Oh, I've got a question. Sorry. Um, will these lessons be uploaded to YouTube? Yes, I just uploaded four lessons today. Sorry, I finally managed to get access. Or, yeah, I finally managed to get access to some decent Wi-Fi uh, and I uploaded four lessons today. So if you go on there, all the elephant stuff is there. The last of the uh, the one about horses is uploaded because I never uploaded that for a while. I actually had to re-record it because there was a problem with recording the other one. It cut out halfway through. So I started from scratch. Um, and then I've uploaded elephants, dugongs, afro insectophila, and I'll upload this lesson tonight straight off to class. So yeah, if that's all, oh, I've, got, I've got chat questions. Um, you yeah, know, Willie is asking that. If there are any other questions, guys, uh, that's all. We're going to wrap up tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. Short and sweet, only 30 minutes, although it's usually about 35 to 40 minutes. But yeah, cool, guys. I'm going to say auf Wiedersehen. Adios, arrivederci, bon voyage. Thanks very much, Nick. Very interesting. No worries, guys. So I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good evening. Yeah. Bye. Cheers, cheers. Bye.